In this video, we're going to show you a step-by-step -step process that we took to create a tin-based brush-on silicone mold and multi-part support shell for both of the parts of our original model. Now, if you haven't already seen the videos, make sure you check out the links down in the video description. There's going to be links to the video of the prepping of the model, as well as casting into the mold once we finish it. This is a three-part video series. Now, let's just jump into this project and see how these are made. Now first we are going to set up the working surface for the mold making process of the upper skull. So note that on the clay container I have clearly written tin clay on it. That means that this material, this clay is used for tin silicone applications only. Otherwise it will inhibit the cure of platinum cure silicone. So keep your clays identified and separated. This is Sculptix Soft that is already rolled out in a very specific thickness and cut down to slabs so that it's ready to be used. And this is going to be the base for my model. This is where the model sits on. This is what the mold is going to be made on. Here I'm filling the area between the model and the working surface that's still left as a gap in this case. So I simply roll out some of the Sculptix oil-based clay and fill it uh, simply by pressing it into that cavity. We don't want to have a cavity between the model and the working surface. A couple of more teeth are inserted to the uh, inside part of the upper jaw and some of these are actually going to be held in place in the Sculptix itself. So we're not even going to um, adhere them. So one more time, I'm checking the perimeter of the model, making sure everything is sealed. There's no gap here all along. So that's good. And now we are ready to make our mold. And now I'm going to apply some Ease Release 205 to the model itself. So we don't want to lift up any of the previous paint off of the model. So some release agent covering the model itself should minimize any material that's going to be stuck or lifted in our mold. Make sure that you don't over apply the release agent and allow it to pool at the bottom of your setup. Allow it 10 minutes to dry before proceeding on to the next step. As mentioned before, we're going to be using the Moldmax Stroke, which is a brushable tin silicone rubber. I'm adding a little bit of black silicone pigment due to the fact that this material does not have a clear color indicator when it's mixed well. Now this product has a 100A to 10B by weight mix ratio, so you do need to use an accurate gram scale. Now as always, scrape the sides and scrape the bottom of your mixing container. And once the mold max stroke is mixed, we can apply it to the model. And because this is a large model, I like to get the material onto the model and then spread it using a chip brush. In this case, a three inch chip brush. This is an extremely large model. So we like to work with the appropriate tools. Now, once I brush the material around, I do like to use some uh, compressed air to make sure that there's no air bubbles that are stuck in these uh, first layer of the rubber. The compressed air further pushes the material into the crevices and details of the original model, thus capturing the finest detail of it. And you can see how large the model is. I can't just mix one batch of rubber and work with one batch on the entire model. I have to mix several large batches and make sure that I have enough working time with the material or the material is fluid enough when I'm applying it in a large area. And once again, I like to come back with some compressed air, make sure that there's no air bubble stuck in the uh, first coat of the silicone. Do note here that we brush on the silicone about two to three inches beyond our model over the 
oil-based clay. This will give us a nice wide edge on the top or the opening around our mold. One more quick look. Once we cover everything on the model, if you want to take a quick look, make sure that you have all the surfaces covered with the first layer. The mold max stroke is now allowed two hours partial cure before moving on to the next step. Now, quick finger check, making sure that the material is set up enough that we can apply the second layer and we won't disturb the first layer. And on the second layer, you can see I pigmented the silicone with some green pigment, and that is simply so we can see where we're applying the material. Now, at this point, in your head, you should already have figured out where the mold is going to be split. We're just applying material to get a first uh, impression off the original model, capture all the detail. Now, once we apply all the material to this layer and we cover all the previous layer, we can then allow the material a partial cure for two hours. And here you can see that some of the material that has formed into drips can be snipped away using scissors. This is unnecessary material that's going to just cause other material to be built up in areas that you don't need it. So remove these as needed, but be careful not to snip cut through the entire layer. Now we're ready for our layer 2.5. This is a thickened layer. So you can see here I thickened up my uh, mold max stroke using some Thyvex. And then I'm going to start by filling in the undercut areas. So I'm going to use this thickened material to fill any of the undercut areas that I think are going to be uh, problematic in the uh, creation of the support shell and in the demolding process. So the areas here between the teeth need to all be filled. Those are deep cavities, uh, no pun intended, teeth, cavities, get it? Um, but all those areas do need to be filled in with a layer of thickened material. So you can see how many different batches of thickened material I had to mix here just to get one coat that's thickened. The mold max stroke is now allowed two hours for a partial cure before moving on to the next step. Now we're going to proceed with a layer three. So this is covering everything. So everything that was thickened gets covered again with another layer. You can see here, I'm keeping the colors uh, the same so I can see where one layer has covered. Again, we're going to allow this a partial cure for two hours before moving on to the next step. We're stepping up to the next layer. We still have some undercuts that we need to fill in this area here that I'm pointing out. I'm worrying that we're going to get a support shell that's going to get stuck in that area. So further thickening of material using Thyvex and then filling any of those um, areas that need extra material, either because of undercuts or because we need extra material on those areas, like the tips of the teeth here. You can see that we're going to need extra material there because those are very pointy and minimal material is being built up. And as always, take a look over the entire uh, mold to make sure that you're not missing areas as you're applying the material. Just like we did on previous layer, this layer is allowed a partial cure for two hours. We're aiming for the same thickness throughout the entire mold, but there will be some areas that are going to be thinner and some areas that are thicker. Now here, once again, we're covering everything with one layer, encapsulating all the different layers that are thickened, making sure that we get a even thickness all throughout. The material is now allowed to partial cure before moving on to the next step. In the meantime, what we can do is pour some keys and channels. So these are poured out of the same material we're using with no pigmentation in this case. So just a quick and important note here. Note on the aluminum channel that I've written down tin silicone. That means that this tool is only meant to be used for tin based materials. Otherwise it can inhibit the cure of platinum silicones if you go back and forth and switch the materials you're using it for. 
The keys are poured and demolded after two hours of partial cure. They're still in a green state where they're not fully cure and are going to chemically bond very well with fresh material being applied to them. These are going to be used as keys around the perimeter of the mold and in some cases the round ones are going to be in wide areas so that span wide areas and we need to make sure that uh, the silicone doesn't fall out of the support shell. Now some thickened material is applied to the separation line that's already pre-made and then we're going to hold it in place using some sewn pins. As the material starts to thicken up, it becomes easier to smooth it out and feather the edges around the separation line. Now keep in mind these lines here, they're for two purposes. They help us separate the different parts of the support shell and break down the support shell. Here at the bottom, they're gonna act as keys and lock into the support shell and hold it in place. And furthermore, they're going to help us cut the mold apart Part. So there's going to be enough material in an uh, area where we need to cut it and that's why we use these channels. The material is now allowed two hours for a partial cure before moving on to the next step. Now that the material has set up partially we can come back and remove those pins. Some of the silicone that's sticking out gets cut away and then we're going to finalize the mold by applying one final layer of silicone over everything this is the final layer it helps encapsulate all the previous layers and we're not pigmenting this again to make sure that uh, we have a good visual of the coverage of our mold the mold is now allowed to cure for 16 hours before moving on to the next step. It's now been 16 hours since we applied the last material to our mold and we're going to trim the extra rubber around the perimeter creating a nice crisp edge around the perimeter. This will prevent any tearing from the edges of our mold. And then we're going to cut into that separation shim that we built. Notice I'm only cutting a certain depth. This is only about five millimeters, which is about 3 16ths of an inch. And that's because we're going to insert these aluminum shims into that cut. So we're not cutting all the way through. We're cutting only partially to insert these aluminum shims that are going to now help us separate the different parts of the support shell that we're building. I like to use these aluminum shims. For one, you can repurpose them for many, many support shells. And the other thing, they're very thin, easy to work with, easy to cut. Once we insert all of them, we're gonna apply some release agent to those shims. It makes them just easier to come off of the support shell. Now for the support shell, we're using an epoxy. This is the Epoxamite 101 Fast, and I've thickened the material a little bit using the Eurofill 11. And we use some blue pigment in this case, so we can clearly see where the material is being applied. Now, when you're working on larger projects like this, make sure that you use the right size tools for that project. So using larger chip brushes here will make my material application much easier and much, much faster. Now some glass fiber is laid into the epoxy and then pressed in with the brush, making the epoxy soak into the glass fibers. Now keep in mind that whenever you're laminating epoxy and glass fibers like this, you want to make sure that they are randomly overlapping each other and that they are cut into smaller strips rather than few large ones. This will give the extra added strength to the support shell once it's fully cured. Also you want to make sure that the glass fibers are fully saturated in the epoxy. Now typically you can apply 
all the layers of the epoxy and glass fibers in one go and let them cure. But when I'm working on vertical surfaces, or in this case even places where it's hanging upside down, I like to give it a partial cure because the material just sets up enough that it won't move from the application area. It also allows us then to build up additional layer without having to worry about them slumping or separating with air voids in between. So I'm going to allow the epoxy a partial cure of one hour before applying additional layers. A second coat of Epoxamite 101 Fast is applied and additional glass fiber layer is applied to the build. Do note that we're not using any of the Eurofill 11 on the subsequent layers of the epoxamite. This is to keep the epoxy thin and also allow it to fully penetrate into the glass fibers. Now this type of application is known as a composites mold or sandwiching application. We are embedding a layer of a lightweight filler material, in this case the freeform air, between a layer of the epoxamite with glass fiber cloth and a final layer of epoxamite with glass fiber cloth, resulting in a very strong and durable yet lightweight support shell. So this is Freeform Air, the standard version, really easy to use. I love this material. Uh, it's very strong and lightweight. And you can see here I'm building some ridges into the Freeform Air, and that's going to allow us to create even a stronger overall structure, surferal st surface structure. Now, once the Freeform Air has partially cured, we're going to follow up with one final layer of the epoxamite with the glass fiber embedded into the epoxamite. Finally, once that layer has partially set up, we're going to attach some handles for easier maneuvering and handling off the mold and support shell. These are attached temporarily with some hot melt glue, which is then embedded with some freeform air and a coat of epoxamite and glass fibers. So everything receives one more layer of the epoxy with the glass fibers. Again, making the overall support shell much stronger while keeping it lightweight. Our composite epoxy support shell is now allowed 16 hours to cure before moving on to the next step. Uh, we can remove some of the aluminum shims easily with some pliers pull those out and again we're going to put some ease release 205 on the epoxy in this case to make sure that the second half of our support shell does not stick and now the process is repeated on all the remaining parts of the support shell you can see that this is a multi-part support shell so it makes it really difficult to uh, understand how these parts all come together but one thing that you have to understand is you need to break down these parts all before you start making the mold so you have to break them down in your head before you start making the mold to understand how it's going to come apart another thing I wanted to bring to your attention when you're working on a multi part support shell like this you don't have to wait for 16 hours till you start working on another section just choose another section off your support shell that does not directly touch to that part and you can actually build that entire section out as well now that the support shell is finished we also made some uh, legs for the mold and they are adhered to the rest of the mold same way that the mold is made using some epoxy and epoxy putty these legs on the mold are going to make it easier for the mold maker to handle the mold and work with the mold once it's created the mold is then allowed a full cure of 16 hours before proceeding on to the next step. It's been now 16 hours. Our support shell has cured and we can go ahead 
and proceed to the cleaning up of the support shell. Keep in mind the epoxies are quite sharp on these edges now that have cured up and we want to make sure to remove any sharp edges before handling the mold and I like to use the four and a half inch grinder for that. Uh, a couple of hands here to help me turn the mold over and then we're going to chase the edge off the top of the mold as well. And then we're going to proceed by drilling holes that are going to allow us to bolt the entire mold together. So all the support shell pieces need to be bolted back together. And that's what these holes are going to be helping us with. Now for the second part of the skull, the lower jaw, I pretty much followed the same process to make the mold, except that I made a two-piece mold. And for the support shell, I made three parts. I will continue to focus on the main piece, but I wanted to show you that I followed the same process for the smaller piece. Now the entire support shell comes apart. Again, go slowly and pry it from multiple angles. And here again, I'm using some extra hands. Pry the mold away from the support shell. And that's how easily that comes apart. If you've done your math correct, and you can see the parts of the support shell just falls off on its own. This is great because this composite epoxy support shell is very strong and durable yet lightweight. I don't have to worry about the support shell actually getting damaged when being dropped on the floor. They're gonna be held together by the bolts, but uh, come apart very easily. So that is very good planning. Now some of the areas still need to be cleaned out here. These are the keys that help keep the mold in the support shell. I like to clean any sharp edges in the mold itself in the support shell. Uh, it prevents any kinds of rips and tears in our mold. And now the uh, fun part, we get to split the mold apart. So we need, do need to make a cut in the mold itself and go slowly here. As you can see, I'm going very slowly, uh, making several different cuts to make sure that I open the mold the way I intended to. When you do cut the molds open like this, you want to cut in a zigzag pattern and not in a straight sharp edge. And here we have our mold off the model. Everything came apart perfectly. There is a couple of air bubbles that did get trapped, not in the surface, but in the thickened layer we applied between the teeth. So we're gonna mix some of the silicone with the thickener and then fill those air voids. That is allowed now to fully cure for another 16 hours before closing the mold. Make sure you don't close that on top of itself because it will bond that area. The mold now gets uh, put back into the support shell for the casting process. And you can see here that a good created mold makes it easy to work on and those legs that we uh, embedded in the support shell make it uh, possible for me to work on this mold by myself without having to have an extra set of hands that holds everything for me in place while we bolt it together. So a little bit of planning ahead of time goes a long way in the uh, process of your molding and casting. Something to keep in mind is that a Work like this will take multiple days to create. It took me about three days to create the support shell. That's not to say that I worked on the support shell eight hours a day, but between the prepping of the material, sandwiching the materials, the epoxies, and creating of the legs that the mold is going to stand on, it took quite a lot longer than what is apparent in the video. Now, if you got inspired by this project and you'd like to give your own projects a go and need some material, you can visit any one of our distributors around the world. So, and there you have it, a step-by-step -step procedure that we took to create a large-scale brush-on tin base silicone mold with a multi-part support shell for both of these models. Now, remember, this is a second part to a three-part video series. So if you want to check out the setting up of the model or casting into the mold, make sure you take a look at the links down below. 
Now, if you have an idea about what we should do next, also let us know down in the comments below. And if you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. Keep up with our latest mold making, casting, and other videos. Remember to subscribe.